people who are trying, who are kind of probably at the beginning of their career, or maybe aspiring to be at the beginning of their career. Um, and so, so this is not a, this is not a, I gave a talk two days ago about creating apprenticeship programs. So this is, that'd be a talk at people who have that kind of authority and power to be able to create apprenticeship programs as a hiring mechanism or an onboarding mechanism. This is, this is basically career guidance for new programmers. So um, it doesn't mean it's only like, if you're not a beginner, like you should leave. It, I'm just, but this, you know, obviously just kind of repurpose this for your own like mentoring or coaching that you do or a team leading or whatever it is um, with, uh, with developers. So yeah, let me uh, get into it and just talk a little bit about, a little bit about my background with this. Um, my apprenticeship story. Uh, so I was like, like, uh, like a lot of people in software development, uh, kind of late to the game. In my mid-20s is when I uh, switched into technology and learned HTML. Slowly, slowly switched into technology. Learned HTML in 1999 and uh, joined a, a little education startup near Chicago in 2000 and, and uh, as a content contributor and um, HTML editor and all that good stuff. Um, and then in order to keep my job as the dot-com bubble burst, I um, needed to learn Perl. Um, and that was like a, one of my big first opportunities to become a programmer. Um, started apprenticing, quote unquote, in 2000. A really good book called Software Craftsmanship.
And like I said before, if, the, if you're not somebody at the beginning of their career where this is applicable to, hopefully just putting names on these things helps you be a better coach and mentor to, to new programmers. So I'll just kind of take it through. I mean, I, this, these, these are the 10 we're going to be going through, and I'll just gonna take, it, take it one at a time. Any, any questions at this point? We've got a nice small room, so you, it can be really interactive if you guys want. No questions? OK. OK, so one of the most important things that an apprentice, that somebody new, in my opinion, needs is very concrete skills. And, and especially in the context of somebody who's getting into software development without really any credentials, right? Maybe, you, maybe, maybe you've gone through a four-year degree and you maybe have a bunch of non-concrete skills, like a lot of theory, but you, have, um, but you have that credential that you can kind of wave and somebody's going to hire you because of it. Um, in this con the context of this pattern is that you need some concrete skills to get a job, right? And so you really need to focus on skills as an apprentice that can make an immediate impact on the team that you're getting hired into. Um, Maybe you don't understand the deep theory of algorithms just yet, but you, know, you understand how to write ant scripts, or you understand how to um, debug unit tests that keep failing. Um, these are the things, I mean, one, one of the, where I work right now at Dev Bootcamp, one of the kind of mottos is we, we want to get people good enough so they can get paid to keep learning. And that's kind of what you're looking for here with concrete skills. You need enough concrete skills to validate or like to, so that you're not, so that you're able to make some contributions while you're continuing to fill your knowledge gaps. And so you're trying to err on the side of skill versus theory in this case, which is, you know, in, in, in the short term that works. In the long term, you need to get that theory, right? Um, and, but this is a way to, so that you can actually have, get paid <clears throat> and then like get experience and get you know time in the trenches with other software developers who are more experienced than you while you're get, getting that theory. Um, the, next, the next pattern um, is your first language. And it, it, I, it's Venkat's talk was, was just awesome. He's such a great speaker. And, uh, and, it, it, and, it, and he's totally right that you should try to learn a new language about once a year or so. Um, and he even mentioned blob programmers. Um, I think as a, as a beginner, you, you should actually allow yourself to, uh, temporarily to be a blob pr programmer and just let yourself fall in love with that first language. Um, where, I, where, I, where I teach and, and lead right now um, day to day, there's a bunch of beginners every day. They're learning Ruby, and they're always distracted by JavaScript, <laughs> right? Um, and, and we have to kind of ask them to just focus, right? Uh, if you're learning a brand new language, you really need to let yourself become fluent in it before you start like dabbling with other languages at the same time. Um, and so that's, that's definitely, a, and, 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 and new programmers are enthusiastic and excited and they want to learn five new languages all at once and that, that tends to not work out very well. And so the concept of, of the, your first language pattern is to just really allow yourself to just focus for a year or more on one language. I, this was me with Perl. For the first two years, it's all I knew, and I was, to I was a total blub programmer. I thought it was the only language I'd ever need to know was Perl, because it can do it all, right? I mean, it, of course, every language can do it all for the most part. Um, and I got, but the other nice thing about that is it let me kind of immerse myself in that community as well, like just let myself be in the Perl community um, and then it was, you know, a couple years after that that I, you know, kind of poked my head out and looked around in the wider software development community and learned Ruby and learned Java and, and stuff like that. Um, so, I mean, as, as you're talking to or as you are a beginner, um, allow yourself, yeah, just help people, yeah, just focus, focus, focus on that language. Let, let, them, let them be immersed in it for a year or more. Um, and, then, and then empty your cup, meaning... Your cup is full, right, of this language's knowledge, and now it's time, a couple years down the road, to just empty it out. Take, what, take the idioms that you've learned that Venkat was talking about and, the, and then pick up your next language. Okay. This was actually the first pattern um, that, that kind of got me started on this journey. I was reading a blog post back in 2004, 2005 um, that was quoting 
the, uh, this musician named Pat Metheny, who's, I'm not much into music, but he's a, a re really well-respected guitarist. And, he, and uh, somebody was asking him, what advice would you give a, a, an upcoming guitarist or a new, a, new, a new musician? And this guy said, be the worst, try to be the worst guy in your band, right? Meaning, don't, don't try to be the worst, like don't try to get worse than everybody else, just meaning get into a band that's better than you. And, that, and at the time, that was really, and it, like, it hit me really hard because um, at the time I was, I was trying to get out of the company I was working for and into better companies, right? I was trying to like move, move forward with my career. Um, and even though at the time I, I'd only been programming for a couple years and I was like a senior application developer. Um, and, uh, but I, I'd obviously, be, if, I, if I was only programming for a couple years and I was already a senior application developer, I'd reached a local maximum. Basically, I, I kind of, there's this kind of local company I'm working with and I, I kind of reached the peak already. And, and being the worst means taking, taking a look around and finding an opportunity with a higher peak where people are much, you know, are kind of a couple levels higher than, than the best at the, at the company you're at. Um, and that's hard because, I mean, I had to start at the bottom again. I felt like an idiot when I joined ThoughtWorks. And this was basically the, my ThoughtWorks story. It was like trying to be the worst again. Um, and that was, you know, it was, it was actually really stressful. But, um, but ultimately, um, and in that first six months or so was, uh, again, yeah, really uh, a lot of, lot of dissonance and feeling like an idiot. Um, but ultimately, a really good thing. So be the worst. Um, yeah, obviously, kind of counterintuitive, countercultural, because you tend to want to be the best. But uh, ultimately, really good advice. And feel free to add your own stories if you want to raise your hand and just share them. Um, stay in the trenches. This is definitely countercultural, um, especially, I mean, th this was like a, in hindsight, felt like every day um, I had friends who were taking promotions to management or, or going back and getting an MBA and things like that. And I just felt like I was fighting that, that, that tendency. Um, and, 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 it, it, I, and to a certain extent, it was easy for me to do that because I consciously switched when I was 25, 26 years old into programming. And I did that so that I be, could be a programmer, not so I could be a project manager. Um, but it's still, I mean, like, in, in, at least in the US, I assume it's the sa same way here. Like, getting promoted to management feels like you're, you're doing something right. That it's, you know, you're, you've achieved some sort of success or you've been validated as a good worker. Um, and, I just got to say, I mean, and, and, and the basically the, the, the story to this is that taking your first opportunity to, to into management, to get into management, is not an inherently good idea. That saying no to that opportunity is often the right, the right choice. Um, because we need more awesome software developers, right? Um, I, right now, in the, in the world that I live in, it's not, about, it's not as much about management as it is about entrepreneurial, entrepreneurialism. Um, people want to be entrepreneurs, um, which is which is great. And if you have an, uh, that entrepreneurial tendency, it's always going to be there. But the, the, but honing your craft and becoming a, a better software developer is something that takes time and it takes it takes it takes decades. Um, and my advice to people who kind of have that tendency to want to kind of want to get out of software development as quickly as possible once they achieve some amount of of knowledge is to just, just stick with it and your entrepreneurialism or your leadership abilities are just always going to be there and they're going to bleed out. Um, but just get awesome. Become awesome <laughs> at software development before you consider widening your focus. And again, this is, this is an apprenticeship pattern. This isn't true, you know, all the, you know, for your entire career. But um, it can be, if somebody's, you know, making great progress or has made a good name for themselves in their company and it's only a year or two down into their apprenticeship years, um, you know, it, it's definitely a pattern to try to stay in the trenches. Nurture your passion, right? Um, not everybody gets to work at the coolest company on earth, um, and not everybody gets to um, feel fulfilled every day with their eight, nine to five job. Um, now, Frederick Book Brooks wrote this awesome book called The Mythical Man Month, and I, I love quotes, and I, and I love this quote. Um, because on our best days as software developers, hopefully we feel this way, right? Um, 
that we are, we are getting paid to do something that, that we enjoy. It's not true every day. And, some, and sometimes there's entire years that go by where you don't really feel this way. But it's really important to nurture your passion. I would imagine that at some level, some of us want, or all of us have wanted, are attracted to this profession because it's fun. We like making things. Um, and software development, almost more than any other field, the barrier between us and what we're making is so, so low. It's, it, it's almost non-existent. We can basically have ideas and, and make them uh, with very little resistance. Um, so yeah, so it, it's important in order to to, in order to keep that that, pro that forward progress with you know with your craft to nurture your passion because if you're hating your job every day or if, if or if you're becoming demoralized as a software developer um, why wouldn't you take a, a job or a promotion to management right I mean it's just more money I mean you you might you, you know it's not like you're enjoying your job that much anyway um, so nurturing your passion and this is super important for me when I was working at this company for the three years during kind of the dot-com, uh, dot, dot bust, I should call it, um, to kind of keep my, keep my forward progress. And, and some of the, there's some other patterns that I'm not focusing exclusively, or I'm not focusing as much on right now, but uh, two other patterns are kindred spirits and study the classics. So kindred spirits is a pattern of finding peers, not, not mentors, but just peers, people that are approximately at your same level, and, and, and getting together with them, and being connected to them and just like so one for, for me that was this was having lunch once a week with a guy that in Chicago that that worked at a, a different company but we would get together and we would complain to each other about our jobs or we would pair with each other and this this is when I learned Ruby was 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 having pizza with this guy every week and we would we'd pair program and eat pizza and um, it definitely you know kept kept my, my spirits up and kept my forward progress with the learning um, Another big one for me was studying the classics, right? Um, I had gotten, I'd learned enough Perl to kind of be employable, but I, I had tons of work to do to go back and learn software, like the principles of software engineering and, and, the com and computer science. Um, and so for me, studying the classics was a great way to nurture my passion because the great thing about books in general is they, sh they show this beautiful world of <laughs> where like, you know, reading Martin Fowler's refactoring book, all the refactorings work perfectly and everybody is smart on the teams, and it just sounds awesome. And same thing with like Peopleware or, or other books um, or anything that Jerry Weinberg reads. It all just sounds so wonderful. And, it gives, and as an optimist, <laughs> it gave me hope for the future that I could maybe work with some of these people or, um, or whatever, or, uh, you know, yeah, I don't know. It just it gave me hope. So studying the classics was really helpful for me in that way and for lots of other reasons. Um, so nurture your passion, really important. Um, an obvious one is finding mentors. Um, although it's not necessarily something that we tend to learn growing up, we're basically just handed our mentors or our teachers, right? We're basically, they're assigned to us and we to them. Um, but it's an important skill to take matters into your own hands as an apprentice and find, and find a mentor. Um, this was difficult for me, I, I grew up very shy and so reaching out to authority figures or, or people that I looked up to and asking them for help or trying to establish a relationship with them was, was difficult, um, but really, really rewarding. And it wasn't, and it, so for me, like the, the first time I did this was I went to like an agile user group in Chicago and I noticed, or I just, I, yeah, I, I got to know the, um, the guy that was in charge of it and just asked him, hey, hey, can I, can I take you out to breakfast, you know, some week? And, and then we just, it just turned into a, a pattern, or a, a, we would just do that periodically, like a once every month or every, every two weeks, and it made a huge difference to me, just in my confidence. We didn't even code together. He was just he, he was teaching me about agile and helping me prepare for a presentation to like upper management, um, and it's just it, it gave me a huge amount of confidence to, to ha that he took the time to do that, um, and and and. As part of you know validating these 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 patterns, um, I talked to a lot of people it, it, within ThoughtWorks when I worked there, and interviewed very very um, like kind of noteworthy people, um, mid-level people and junior people, and all of, and it seems it seemed to me that all of the very senior and, and accomplished people that I talked to could always point back to one or two 
mentors that you know that made a difference to them along the way. Um, and that, so that was obviously very validating, and I know I, that's true for me. Um, all right, so here's another um, kind of counterintuitive one. Um, expose your ignorance, right, which is something we all naturally want to hide because we don't want to feel stupid. Um, but Jake Scruggs is a Chicago software developer who uh, ha was an apprentice. He was actually a, a high school um, physics teacher turned, uh, turned software apprentice and now software developer. He, um, how many of you guys have heard of Uncle Bob? Yeah? So uh, Object Mentor was where Jake... Uh, Jake apprenticed, and uh, so he was surrounded by Uncle Bob and, and Uncle Bob's crew back then. Um, and Jake says, you know, tomorrow, and this, is his, this was his, like, journal that he was keeping during the experience, tomorrow I need to look stupider and feel better about it, you know. Because um, he, he was doing what a lot of us have done in the past, which is staying quiet, trying to figure things out on our own, and not letting people around us know that we have no idea what the heck they're talking about. Fortunately for me, like, I was trained as a, as a therapist, in, 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 you know, and trained in psychology, and, and, the, and asking stupid questions was basically what I learned <laughs> how to do, right? Just, like, ask, like, I have no problem asking, asking kind of the stupid question, um, and that was a huge benefit to me um, as a software developer, because, um, especially as one who had no formal training, but um, even if you do have formal training, you're gonna show up on a job and people are gonna be using words and concepts that you have no idea what the heck they're talking about. And you can do one of two things. You can ask them what they mean and look, risk, looking like, risk looking stupid. Or you can like silently, hopefully, make note of what they said and go Google it later. Um, or you'll probably just forget about what they said. And, you, and it's, it's just basically going to slow down your learning. Um, and so what I've heard, or what I've, what I've experienced is that exposing your ignorance is another way of saying exposing your learning process to the people around you. Um, and it's hard at first, but once you are, once you've established that you can learn quickly, like you get a reputation for that, um, and that's a really good, that's a very portable reputation, right? Um, if if it, you, you could be known as a good Java programmer or a good Ruby programmer, whatever it is, but if you're good at learning things, then you could do a whole lot of different things. Um, so difficult at first, but once you kind of get over the, once you get the hang of exposing your ignorance, a really powerful pattern. And it worked really well for Jake. He, he, I think he did, he did uh, try to look stupider the next day. And he got to go from Object Mentor's apprenticeship. He, got, he went straight into ThoughtWorks. And then he worked at a company that I was at called Optiva. And now he's doing other interesting things as a senior developer in Chicago. Um, so on the flip side of exposing your ignorance, which is a very, uh, you know, sometimes a very uh, awkward feeling and creates dissonance in you sort of uh, pattern, is retreat into competence, which is kind of a comforting pattern. And it helps you cope with your perceived incompetency. Like at the end of the day, maybe it's been a year or something that you've been do kind of you know, trying to ramp up in into software development, and you come home and you feel like an idiot. Um, this was helpful for me to every once in a while just retreat into competency, meaning I know how to do some things. I do, I do know how to do a couple of things I've learned a couple over the last year. I'm just going to go do those things, right? I'm, I'm going to go start a little project. Um, because I know how to do a little bit of TDD and, and I know how to make my test green and, or, or whatever it is. I know how to um, slurp down an XML file from the web and, and pipe it into a database or whatever it happens to be. Um, and it's, yeah, it's a really simple concept, and, but it, apprentices need to be reminded of this because um, uh, uh, they, you know, they'll, they'll tend to just be hungry, 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 hungry for more and they'll forget to take care of themselves um, along the way. So retreat into competence is, is an important one. Breakable toys. Um, this is something that Venkat just talked about. Um, we can all benefit by doing occasional toy programs um, if for lots of different reasons. The one that Newth was talking about here was creating artificial restrictions on yourself, for, which is kind of fun, right, in a, in a strange way. Like, I don't know, like I'm gonna write a program that has no ease in it or something. Um, or I'm going to write a program that doesn't, you know, consume more than X amount of memory. Um, and it, for apprentices, it's, t you know, breakable toys lives up to the name. It's a place where you can take risks. It can, it, can be, it can break. You know, you spend all day trying to write code that's unbreakable or very robust. This is an opportunity to uh, write code that is risky 
and, and, and is possible, and, and is possible, you know, quite quite po possibly break if you put it in different contexts. Um, and, and one of the most important things about it, and this is why it's a good technique to keep with you for, for your entire career, is when you learn a new technique, you tend to you get you, you get infatuated with it, like Venkat said, and then you overuse it. And this is the right place to do it, right? Um, I learned about Redis, this data store, right? Um, and so, and I fell in love with it. I was totally infatuated with it. All data should live in Redis, you know, because uh, it's the greatest. Um, and so I just, I, I knew enough to know that that was kind of silly, but I wanted, to, I needed to kind of scratch that itch. So I made a project. I, the only database in it was Redis. And it was totally silly, but I learned a ton about it. And in the process, I, you know, I was able to take, even though that project was basically a throwaway, um, even though it was somewhat practical and kind of going after a problem that I was interested in on the side, I was able to take a lot of the stuff I learned about Redis and actually take it and use it in my day job. Um, and this was just, you know, a year and a half ago. Um, so, but for, but for apprentices, this is even more important because um, this is probably their first safe place um, where they can kind of stretch their own, own wings um, a little bit. So breakable toys. Um, Again, something that is pretty established. This is just, a lot of these patterns is just about putting a name on it. All right, and then share what you learn. Um, basically, you know, a, the, the blogging pattern or the tweeting pattern um, or, or the give a, give a lunch and learn sort of talk pattern. Um, you know, uh, the company I work for right now is called um, Dev Bootcamp. Um, and it's it's a it's a place where where students come and take nine weeks and get up to basically becoming an employable software developer or an apprenticeable software developer. Um, and one of the one of the one of the best parts of, of watching that process is watching the students stand up and teach other students things, um, which is great. In, it's just like it's great in many levels. But one of the one of the best parts about it is the fact that it's reinforcing something that they've they've just recently learned. Um, the other great thing about it is it's sometimes hard for me, who's been doing this now for 13 years, to speak at the, same, at the correct level f for somebody who's, you know, just started doing this, if, um, you know, within the last year. Um, and that the yellow belt to white belt, it, uh, I guess, pattern or, or concept is something that I learned while I was doing martial arts, which was, all right, well, there's this black belt in the room, but I'm a white belt, and, and it seems like the yellow belt's the one giving me a lot of the lessons. Um, and that's because the yellow belt can speak my language, and because it's almost a waste of the black belt's time to spend time with me. Um, and so, yeah, that's another, that's another nice aspect of um, share what you learn, is just that the yellow belt, a yellow belt sharing what they learn, it's, it's going to be generally pretty digestible and easily digestible um, by a white belt, which is obviously the, the apprentice. So that's the ten patterns. There's dozen more in the dozens more in the book, um, and there's does I'm sure there's dozens more um, that we didn't talk about. Um, uh, since in the four years since we published it, there's been you know people have blogged about other other patterns that they they've discovered. Um, so there's that. This is I mentioned Deb Bootcamp. It's the company that, that I'm I'm a co-founder of. Um, it's a it's kind of a, it's, I guess there's a little bit of a trend happening right now in the U.S. and, and, and starting to branch outside of the U.S. of, of these, uh, basically these, these like short-term, very immersive schools that are popping up that help meet the demand for software developers. Um, and it's a place that, it's kind of the target audience for my book, which is a nice thing, um, if you want to learn more about it. Um, does anybody have any questions or thoughts or disagreements? S some of this bad advice? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, don't, you don't want a bunch of people at the same level. You don't want a bunch of people working together at, who are apprentices. Yeah. 
<laughs> like that's a different problem. That's a rate, that's a like a junior senior ratio problem. Um, like a lot of this is all you know couched in the context of, um, yeah, like that there's that there's the right junior senior ratio, um, and 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 for me this was. I needed it, for me to like go and learn about algorithms, and I, I needed to get enough programming language level context in order to, to learn it. Um, just because I didn't have the luxury or the I hadn't chosen the right major back then to, to have somebody kind of spoon feed it to me a little bit more. Do you, other thoughts on it or? Yeah. So I, I guess the other thing I was trying to point out there was yeah. also that there is a context here. Sure. Yeah, and all all these patterns have a certain context. I didn't I didn't go through like each of that. One of the things I learned at Plop was, um, and, and you can see this in pretty much every pattern language. Is there's a context, there's a problem, and there's a solution, and there's lots of other um, asp like attributes of patterns. But that was the kind of the minimal pa the minimal attributes we had in ours was context, problem, and solution. And you're right. Um, I mean, in general, if if you don't have the theory at all, like, yeah, it's a question. It's really a question of how are you going to get. What's the best way to get the theory? It could be go back to school, but that might not be a, an option for you. It wasn't an option for me. I you know I was already married with a kid, and I just had to like get a job. You know. Other thoughts? Regarding the same thing yeah. that you mentioned, the best part of uh, understanding the theory, what I was thinking is uh, challenging the theory or for validating the theory, you challenge the theory and that's how I think uh, we can do this. Because theories are something which are established, right? So once we challenge why they are established, maybe in the process you understand that. Yeah, that's true. And, and there's, it's definitely a pattern or an anti-pattern, I don't know what you'd want to call it, but of you know young enthusiastic software developers challenge like kind of challenging theories or thinking that they have just found the new, the new theory. No, you you probably haven't, but it's a great way to learn <laughs> the old correct theories. Yeah, I mean, so the the talk I gave, yeah, the, the the talk I gave two days ago was more about the apprenticeship program side of things, um, and I think that is much more beneficial. If, if it, so, the, I think the ideal situation is when if a newcomer is hired, they are brought in and mentored by people in the trenches, at you know, on the team that they're joining, um, over the course of six months, and that's that's a hard. It's hard to find people that can do that mentoring and. and kind of multitask a little bit with having a beginner around and they have their normal responsibilities. Um, but it's in, but if a company is willing to make that kind of investment, it, it works out wonderfully. Because, yeah, I mean, if, if you're kind of like hiring people, shipping them off to get trained, and then they come in, there's still going to be this like disconnect that happens. And you might end up, and it, it's, it seems like that's kind of an easy way of like onboarding like 10 people at once and then dumping them onto some, something, um, which is, an anti-pattern. Other thoughts? Yeah. So I work as a freelancer. I don't have a big structure to help me with stuff. I, I've got the opportunity to guide a couple of people uh, now, some students and someone who is beginning in that uh, career. So my goal to come here was to understand what could I do to become good as a guide to them. What would you say is the most important thing I could yeah. do? Yeah. Um, I think the most important thing is to establish feedback loops okay. with them, right? Um, and ultimately, the most important feedback loop we created in, in the apprenticeship program that I created was a six-month, <coughs> like, you're in or you're out okay. sort of feedback loop. But that was important to me because you get attached to these people and it's hard to let them go. Right. But if they, like, for us, we, I mean, it doesn't have to be six months, but for us, it was like, that was the, the biggest feedback loop was, like, all right, you have six months to get up to like 
a entry level sort of position or whatever it happens to be for you. Um, and then breaking it up into smaller chunk time boxes inside of there. Okay. Um, it, all the way down to, I guess the smallest would be pair programming, but the next biggest one would be like a, a weekly check-in. That um, Even if you're working with them all day, every day, it's still a time to just talk about how it's going. Um, so I think that's probably the most important, important one. That helps, okay, cool. Other thoughts, questions? Dave? Yeah, I mean, I, for me, I, I, it's just, yeah, having to learn the theory after, or getting to learn the theory after learning to be, you know, learning to be a proficient Perl programmer was, I just, I couldn't imagine, it was hard to imagine the other way. I remember reading, trying to read structure and interpretation of, com, of computer programs, like, you know, just like six months after I started, and it was just so difficult. But then reading it again a year, a year later, much more approachable, because I could just, I could think I could think it through practically, and I don't, maybe that's not true for, for everybody, but it, it sure was for me. I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that. <laughs> Other thoughts? Yeah. I was just reminded there's a there's a TED talk about actually from India. I forget the name or anything, but a, a teacher in 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 regular schools that put like five or six students in a, in groups. Mm -hmm. Groups of five or six students in front of a computer, ask them a question that they basically don't have the premise to understand or the knowledge to understand, and then ask them to like find the answer by searching and stuff. Which is fascinating by that. Like, you dump people into a pool in a group so they can interact and and, and <coughs> then have to find the answer together using you know the internet as a big resource. As opposed to teaching them like kind of more theoretical things yeah, in the as background. As opposed to like breaking it down into steps. Right. Or I mean, I think the internet <laughs> like allows for that sort of approach. I mean, all of the one context of all this is this all happened after the internet or the the web happened. I don't know how I could have become a programmer <laughs> without like Yahoo and Google. Um, so that that makes that makes a lot of sense. Anything else? Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. Questions. So I think you know, it, it should happen to the other side as well. The mentor gives you that comfort zone that you can ask right. questions. That's one I, of the, yeah. I, I'm here to help you out. And I'm not going to you know, make fun of you. Yes, on the, on, the, on the more senior side of apprenticeship, um, creating safety is super important. And it's, at Dev Boot Camp, that's one of the biggest things we focus on is giving people the, helping people feel safe Ask. It's, it's naturally a competitive place where there's like, you know, 18 newcomers all trying to learn the same stuff at the same time. Um, but creating that safety is really important. And one of the ways to do that, um, that we would do that was, that was pretty concrete that probably you, a lot of you guys could, could do. We would have a lunch and learn every week, which is a lot of companies do that. Um, and, and somebody would come and talk about something they're learning. And it's usually something new and, and interesting. And a lot of people in the room don't know what the heck they're talking about. And the most senior people at Optivo always in, like almost enjoyed asking the stupid questions. Even if they knew the answer sometimes, they would have the empathy for the junior people in the room and just take the hit and just be like, what does MVC mean again? You know, or, or asking those sort of questions. Um, it's a, definitely a lead by example sort of thing. Because there's, I mean, like, yeah, I mean, at any level, at any point in your career, there's always new things that, you're, that you could be asking questions about. Other thoughts? Other questions? Yeah. Um, through my experience working with a lot of people, I come from an organization 
150,000 people. 150,000? Okay. So what I've observed is that um, Every time when a pattern doesn't work, try another pattern. And you've got to be discovering patterns because people are people, they are unique, and they want to learn. Yep. And something existing might not work for them. So just try or something. That's good advice. Yeah, a meta pattern. <laughs> That's good advice. Did you, yeah, you have one other thing? Well, I was just expanding on that, like yeah. allowing yourself as, a, as the leader or the mentor to be vulnerable as well, right? That's exactly what you're saying. Right. To show your own weaknesses and your own edge of where you don't understand or know. Right. Absolutely. Cool. Well, thanks, everybody. Hopefully, this gave you some ver terminology to think about. Appreciate the questions and the thoughts. Yes. Yeah. So, what do you say? People don't want to hear could possibly leave, but can you say a little bit about the cookies? Sure. Yeah, feel free to go if you want. Um, there's cookies and good things out there. Um, <laughs> but even better things here. But there's uh, there's not maybe some more knowledge here. Um, so ask me real ask me like concrete questions. So what is it? What is Deb Bootcamp? Yeah, so it was a company started in San Francisco in last February um, when somebody, one guy knew another guy who, the more senior guy said, I think you should be a software developer. Do you want to be a software developer? And the guy was like, I do. I want, I want to figure that out. Um, and so then the senior guy was like, all right, well, I'm going to go on Hacker News and say, I'm teaching this guy software development. Does anyone else want to learn with us? You know, for some money. Um, and, and he got flooded by all these people um, wanting to do it. Um, and that's how Dev Bootcamp started. And, it, and at the first, first group was about 20 people. Um, and it's, it was a 10-week a program at that point um, where they would you know, spend, pay some tuition, basically, for the 10 weeks, <clears throat> go through the program. And at the end, employers are invited in to interview them. And then the idea is to get them up to employable, up an employable level. And almost everybody in that room, I think everyone except one person got a job pretty quickly afterwards. Um, you know, it taps, it's basically tapping into a really hot job market, basically. Um, and so over the, over the course of the year, um, that progressed. Um, a couple more batches went through. Um, and I got to know them over that year. And so I decided I wanted to, to start it in Chicago. Um, and so now the, the program looks like this. Um, Basically, you know, as a lot of us are aware, there was a ton of online, online resources and, and these massive open online courses that are happening. And so there's all these people that are getting up to kind of dabbler status with software development, web development, um, and computer science. But they don't really know how to parlay that into some, to a job. And so people are tending to come into Dev Bootcamp or applying for Dev Bootcamp. With, they, they know how to code a little bit, but not like at professional grade level. Um, and that's and, and so so basically they, they apply, you know, they pay the money, and then they do two months of prep work. Right, right now I've got students that are going to show up on April 22nd, and they've been working on learning Ruby and SQL for the last couple weeks on their own. Um, and then we're going to test them one month before they come, and if they're not up to up to the right level yet, we'll delay when they when they start. Um, and we can do that because they start every three weeks in 18-person batches. Um, so they stay for nine weeks, but they're, they start every, th but a new batch comes in every three weeks, which creates these cool opportunities to delay people yeah. easily by three weeks, and it creates mentoring opportunities between the students. Um, yeah, and we're, and, we're, and we're basically teaching them the Rails ecosystem, um, because that's just in really high demand in, in the U.S. right now. And I assume that's, you know, it's an increasing demand here as well. Um, yeah, and I mean, the results from last year were awesome. Um, you know, over 90% of the students got jobs within a couple months of uh, finishing uh, with pretty remarkably <laughs> high uh, starting salaries and all that good stuff. We'll see how well that translates to Chicago because up to now it's been in Silicon Valley only. So about half the students end up moving to the city in order to do it. It's not just local people. It's about, yeah, half or more of them come from all over the country, sometimes internationally. Um, 
Yeah, it's, and these schools are, I mean, it's not just at boot camp, there's schools like this popping up in a lot of cities all over the place. You're welcome. Other questions about it? So I have a question, something related to this. Okay. Uh, so I moved to Mysore recently, and I'm a Ruby programmer, and uh, I want more Rubies around me. Yep. So I found uh, five people that Calvin here is based there, so that's how I know him. Got it. So we're trying to build a uh, community of Ruby developers there. So we are trying to do something similar. How to are you? This. Cool. Uh, we're thinking of going to colleges and mm -hmm. uh, maybe organize uh, uh, weekly uh, classes classes for them to learn Ruby and Rails. And, Got it. Uh, yeah, that's one idea we are thinking about. That's uh, important. Yeah, it's uh, an important part of a community. One part of it you mentioned is uh, at the end of it, people get the jobs. Right. And that way, they, go, they, they, get, they have some motivation to learn right. and become better. Yeah, every, we, yeah, go ahead. We don't know whether that we can offer that kind of a guarantee to people we come yeah. across. I don't think there are enough, enough Ruby and Rails jobs sure. in Mysore, or maybe even in Bangalore if they can come here. So how would, what would, what can we do to motivate people? But is, is there a point uh, in helping people learn Ruby if we can't guarantee them jobs? Why? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, listen to the stuff that Venkat was talking about before. I mean, even if they learn Ruby and that's not necessarily their jo the job that they're going to get, it doesn't, it still helps them think differently. Um, but the model that this business model, which I didn't I didn't mention, it's it's 40 hours a week of, okay. of uh, training with the students and the okay. students are there 60 to 80 hours a week. Okay. Um, so it's very, very immersive, but they, they feel very disoriented at first because they're basically being immersed into a foreign language uh, space <laughs> or like all this new lingo is being spoken at them all the time. Um, and that, and it, you know, we've got like two, for every 18 students come in, there's eight, there's two instructors with them. So that's all pretty expensive. And so it all hinges on a job market because the students pay some tuition, the, the, uh, they pay $12,000. And then the, the employers pay a placement fee um, also. And so the, all that funds, like that's that level of immersion and that many people in the room helping the students. And we actually pass part of that placement fee back to the student when they get a job, so they get this like signing bonus that kind of helps pay back some of the money they might need need to borrow to do it in the first place. We're trying to we're trying to make it so that it's more employer funded to cut down on that tuition on the on the front. So, Dave. No, they don't. This is I would say this is. This is, yeah, I'd say all the, all the projects they work on are breakable toys. Um, the, uh, the second question is, you know, you have a lot of people that are interested in the Ruby thing, and you have a lot of people that are interested in the Ruby thing, and you have a lot of people that are interested in the Ruby thing, and you have a lot of people that are interested in the Ruby thing, and you have a lot of people that are interested in the Ruby thing, and you have a lot of people that are interested in the Ruby thing, and you have a lot of people that are interested in the Ruby thing, and you have a lot of people that are interested in the Ruby thing, and you have a lot of people that are interested in the Ruby thing, and you have a lot of people that are interested in the Ruby thing, and you have a lot of people that are interested in the Ruby thing, and you have a lot of because for people to pay them as much as we're asking them to pay, um, they need to see a pretty big ROI. And that makes the most sense for pure, uh, quote unquote, pure beginners who might be making, like, they might, they, well, often they're getting a huge pay increase by, t by switching careers. Whereas a, a more senior person who's getting up to the next level, it's going to be probably a, a, a less, it's going to be, it's going to feel less, so they're going to pay less. So it's just going to be a different business model, but that's actually something that we're looking at. Um, and one of the ways we're doing it is by, by once you create these like these overlapping phases between students, there's a lot of mentoring that can happen between them, um, which should be able to cut down on an instructor costs and things like that a little bit. Um, so we're, we're starting to play with that a little bit by having like a fourth phase that students can stay on as like TAs for free, but they're also getting like deeper training uh, that kind of at the next level while they're looking for their first job and it's yeah we're, we're doing a lot of experiments um, yeah did you say that you were thinking about or actually setting something up in India or um, I'm we're looking at where our next city is going to be okay. um, so I've already had people talk to us about you know when are we coming to India um, I'm not sure I'm not sure yet it's all about uh, to a certain extent the economics of it 
We're just in instead of San Francisco and Chicago. So next year we'll probably open one or two more cities. So yeah. Oh, I don't know. I, yeah, that that was. I mean, it's the bottom of a boot. Um, so I don't know. I, I mean, Sharif, the guy that started the company originally, uh, must have come up with it. I I don't. I have no idea. I should. I should. I should know the answer to that question, though. <laughs> Yeah, it works all right. Cool. Cool? All right. Thanks a lot.